Hello, ladies and gentlemen. We are Adventure Some Today Reviews, and today we are reviewing Augury. Answered by Philip Mural. A book about revenge. And the death of empires. And tyranny and mystical prophecies. Such that would make your hat spin around. Ooh. Yes, it's it was a very exciting book. Hopefully, you on. <laughs> this is what I have to work with. This glorious ramp. The iPad is rebelling. It's not my fault. Just start your reading processes. Prophecy. Hate, destiny, augury. Words that promise a chosen one will rise to protect the downtrodden or avenge them. <sighs> Many cultures believe in their champions. Heroes are desperately needed now. The oppressive, technologically advanced Corlane Empire ravages the weak people of Glostamia. The acceptable cultures are forced to assimilate. Too powerful, and utterly disparate crusaders emerge to oppose Korva. Our heroes in question. Yeah. Two dogs has trained his entire life in protector magic. Circumstances suggest he's the hero of legend, but two dogs is the master of his own actions. With a tomahawk in one hand and a knife in the other, he'll prove why it was wrong to start a fight with the, the Krichi tribe. Princess Murid has more reason to hate the Corlanes than most. She's been groomed since childhood on her duties as the Chosen One, but not even her royal status can convince those who adopted her that the Corlanes will soon come to claim their land and resources as well. Dun, dun, dun. Last paragraph. There's more? I know. Can native magic and bar barbarian ingenuity combine to overcome a superior when both sides hold onto their, onto their dogmatic views about fate. Who's the real chosen one? Dun, dun, dun! A sequel. That's a sequel. To the first dun, dun, dun! I prefer to think it of as an as a encore mean... that's been improved by my vocal prowess. Nonsense, nonsense, nonsense. So... The book, the story, the tragedy. Do you have any questions you would like answered? Why would I be asking any questions? The book. I am wise as the Oracle of Delphi. You're cryptic as the Oracle of Delphi. I actually quite like this book, but it is severely hampered by its writing. It improved as the story progressed, which did benefit it, but particularly the dialogue was just off consistently. And not in an off, like, kind of slight, just feeling wrong, it was it was very noticeable to me. Yes, the dialogue was probably the weakest part about the book, and... Which is a bit of a problem, because dialogue actually happens throughout the book. It's, it's a large part of the writing style, which typically is actually quite enjoyable, at least for me. So that's why the writing for me is kind of... Overstated? Repugnant. Yeah! I'm trying to think of how to express what was off about the dialogue in a more technical way. There were a lot of small leaps in logic here and there. And a lot of the dialogue wasn't as clear as it could be. That was your problem with the dialogue? The leaps in logic? Not necessarily. Well, because like, you would think normally leaps in logic would resemble... Natural dialogue more, because we make leaps in logic all the time. Yeah. I might be wrong 
it just a lot of the time I I found myself kind of struggling to decipher the what logic has had been left over and the kind of the, the both the prose and the dialogue starts off rougher as the story at the very start and smooths out immensely as it progresses the only the thing first is, the, the first half and the second half are almost completely different in quality and but the only thing that sort of remains all, a little bit awkward throughout is somewhat the uh, the action scenes the action scenes which are obviously just really hard to write in general but they remained a little bit awkward throughout for me at least not for me i was not displeased with the action scenes i, I was actually like, less than the action scenes themselves and more of just less the actual prose of the action scenes and more the action scenes themselves were things I was going to laud for the book. Not dramatically, but just... Yes, the choreography of the action scenes was decent. And this, to me, smoothed over a lot of the rough edges for the actual prose. So, so much so that I didn't even realize the action scenes were choppy or whatever he... They're not choppy. Per se, they are just not even awkward. It's just they're less limp. snazzy than we might like. No, the prose for the action scenes was often limp and a little bit meandering or a little bit um something lacking of impetus. Setting against no setting against the prose, the general story was. I was very impressed with the narrative arc the story took, and this continued. This was not. This is applied to both the arcs for the characters and that of the general story. Two do both Two Dogs and Murad had very clearly delineated personalities that were strong and multifaceted. It says so in the synopsis that Two Dogs is a master of his own actions, and this is this is very prevalent throughout the story. It's, he's not necessarily um, stubborn in a way. That, that's not stubborn. It's just he's he very much believes that he controls his own fate. And this is actually one of his most appealing characteristics. Especially when you compare it to Murad, who is like, who pretty much wants to be the chosen one. And she has a, has a, um, she is overly impressed with herself in this facet. She thinks she is the one doom, uh, doomed to right the wrongs of the world, which does kind of give her a, bi a bit of a sour taste in my mouth. But it's but that's still decent character creating. I, she didn't leave me with a sour taste in my mouth about that because, one... You understand that's what the story's about, is about the Chosen One coming out. And so, as you're reading it, you're thinking, well, obviously one of these two has to be the Chosen One. And so you have two dogs and you have Murad, and two dogs is surrounded by competent and strong people. Mm -hmm. People who are very capable of standing on their own, who are courageous, etc., etc. Murad is not. Yes, there's competent people, but Murad is trying to make a way in a society that is run by more or less an overly timid ruler, her fiancé slash eventual husband. And it's a society that is vaguely misogynistic. So they don't want her to rule. It's a it's a very war it's a warrior society, so the greatest warrior is king. And you compare that to the fact that they consider women weak, um and they But for me, that helped balance out her belief that she was the quote unquote the chosen one. Because you have, because it doesn't make, because then it becomes less about her feeling entitled and more, more her battling to prove it and to make sure she has the chance to fulfill her destiny against the people who are resisting it. Yeah, I can see that. However, it's, I did not like Muir during the first quarter of the book she felt I was dumb she has this small nation and she wants to go to war with an empire and it's not like it's not here let's form a plan go guerrilla attack or something no it's like let's saddle up boys all four thousand and go attack the castle it's and she is so focused on this she sees nothing else and people say hey let's be cautious she 
Or her advisors say, this might not be the greatest idea. Let's be cautious about this. She says, pretty much, yeah. we're all a bunch of cowards. We're going to war. Rawr. And this is, an, for me, I found this very distasteful. But at the same time, it built, it, this is not accidental. Right? This is, once again, building into the author's ability to construct a narrative fantastically. Because this scene where she's, uh, scenes where she's dislikable, arrogant, and just bullheaded and all that, builds into the climax for her story, which is, I really enjoyed. Agreed. Like, the tail end of this book, the last three quarter, third, whatever, is fantastic. And it really takes the story in a way that you may not have expected. So even if you're kind of slightly tired of, oh, Re Rebels taking out an empire, this book, one, the cultures of the book was one of the best parts of it. The world building was very enjoyable. You have both the diverse cultures. It's not just a random medieval culture or the generic medieval culture here. One of them is more tribal but not more tribal as native american tribal and they hunt giant monsters which have like obsidian on their back and the obsidian is what provides the tribal characters with their magic and they have a full they have their own goddess and their beliefs their own belief system and they have a particular aesthetic and their names are all in line so you have them and and that's two dogs in his entire society and that's an enjoyable experience to explore the story from there. And it's revealed to you well. It's not, There's no it's massive not exposition dump. It was never boring. The cultures came across really well. Even the Corlane Empire culture, who you only kind of glimpse distantly, was expounded upon well and efficiently. And then on the other side, you have Murid, and she's, again, even though, like, curse the culture she finds herself in, is more standard medieval in nature, it has elements of Vikings as well. Mm -hmm. And some of that might just be the name of the culture, but it's still, it's there from the a belief in strength and individual warrior prowess. And, and they, they, they also have their own beasts and they lather themselves in oil to become stronger. Mm -hmm. So the world building was really enjoyable for this book and it helped to I forget whatever point we were really making, but... Smooth out. There's a lot of really good things about the book that just smooth out the small problems with it. Though, obviously, the first half writing is a fairly major problem. I would, I would never... I wouldn't call it a major problem. It's just every now and then it would... I was consistently low burn. <sighs> only the first, once again, then. only through the first half of the book. Um, so, my, marginally returning back to the characters, and the character, to, less so with Murad, but very, at least for me, very prominently with Two Dogs. Two Dogs was a bit flip-floppy between emotions. Is He just got, it just got to his fight, right, with his people, right? Most of the people are dead. He's like, oh no, my people are dead, my brother's gone, oh boo-hoo-hoo, right? Then, but and two minutes later, or he, he gets up. I gotta go check on my friend over there who's dying. He walks past a coin soldier. Goes, "Ha! I killed you!" Literally that. He smiles, grin. It's like, it's he. And this happened consistently throughout the story. Characters flip flop between emotions, and they're not subtle emotions. It's they go from far. They go from ends of the spectrum instantly. And I didn't notice that when I was reading it. Like, I noticed it at some points, like, two dogs not being in control of himself. It's not necessarily in control, lack of control, because it's... Well, it was more like, every now and then, the character, the character would strike me as a little bit temperamental. But now that you mentioned it, there are... I can see how that would be accurate. How accurate. <laughs> right, so, but this is not... At least for me, it was very obviously not intentional as this being part of the character's personality. It was just a small mishandling of the writing. I have one, only one really major complaint with the book. And it 
builds into the ending. You have to be a little bit soft because this is an ending that is somewhat susceptible to spoilers. Like, the ending does matter in this book. And the ending is part of the reasons why I'm heavily, really enamored of this book. And so, while trying to avoid as much as possible, the ending only really works because the characters and the society of the book conspire to hoodwink the reader. The ending comes a little out of the blue. It's not out of the blue. Be the only It's only out of the blue slash quote-unquote surprising because the characters or the character, etc. in question, the society, etc. All the, all the things that build into it don't behave. They purposely conceal elements from the reader so you can get that final reveal. I don't actually, I'm not actually displeased with this because I feel that's actually accurate. There's this revelation that happens in the book and it's a revelation because both in Two Dogs Society and that of Murid, they are in these ideological bubbles, right? And these bubbles are consistent throughout the story and it's, the revelation is when these bubbles are popped. That's not specifically the thing I'm talking about. Like that, like the, the grand reveal was fine, but it was more of some of the boxes they had to check. Specifically one of them for that re reel to work required the deception of the society to deceive the reader specifically. In retrospect, when I was finished reading it, like that's not accurate. Like, the whole grand reveal of everything, mm -hmm. that didn't bother me. That, I agree, that was a really enjoyable part of the book. It's not like, oh my god, I never saw that coming! But still, very enjoyable. So, another um, one, one part of the book that I enjoyed, and the villain was hyper-competent. Yes. So, you have this, you have this technologically advanced nation. On top of which, they have a larger army, and <laughs> the leader of that army is competent. Which is just really nice, because it's, oh, well, okay, it's not a horde of orcs or anything. It's, they actually have an uphill battle going on here. And once again, it builds to a very satisfying conclusion. Agreed. That's not just, oh, the heroes, oh, we will succeed, and BS then ensues. Yes. But at the same time, it's not like, oh my god, he's unbeatable, because while the Corlane Empire is technologically and numer has the numerical advantage, they have no access to the magic of the Lacree tribe. And the Lacree tribe magic is pretty BS. It, it enables uh, two dogs to pretty much fight an arm, like, not necessarily an army army, but a small army all by himself. And so, and then you... In, in top of it all, he's a very competent user of his magic, and he has... But again, doesn't come across as OP and, oh my god, the hero's never challenged, because he's constantly outnumbered and fighting against firearms with hatchets and daggers. So it's actually a fairly balanced competition. Anything else? No, I don't think so. I, I mentioned all my various points. I mentioned all my various points as well. Your parents were obviously inferior to mine, but yes. You're crazy. Au revoir. Liking and commenting, subscribing. Fare thee well, our future friends. What's up? What's up? I didn't have any problems with that, so... That's because you're a philistine. Alright. I'm gonna call you Phil. If you want. Phil Stein. We're gonna call your brother Franken. Whatever you say, Franken. Au revoir! How do you go from Phil to Franken? I said remember you had a brother named Franken, but I'm your only brother, so that means I am would have to be Franken.
But there's no way I'm going to let myself be called Frank, and ergo I am now Phil, and you are now Frank. And... No. Yes. I'm not... In... That logic makes no sense whatever, and I'm not entirely sure any of it made into the video. Oh, you're...